Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very delighted today to be rejoined for the third time by Tony Wan from Reach Capital. Tony, welcome back to Trending in Education. Thank you, Mike, for having me back for this third time. I'm just here to put a magnet. <laughs> exactly. You have now qualified amongst the legendary third time appearers of Trending in Ed who qualify for a refrigerator magnet. Again, assuming this episode gets shipped, you know, I could hold this for a while if we're running low on magnet inventory, but I would expect it to be on its way to you relatively soon. You have an interesting job. You know, we'll refer back to your previous appearances for folks who may not know you, but can you catch folks up in case they haven't been part of the Tony Wan experience so far. Can you catch us up on who you are and what you do? Yeah, the Tony Wan experience is a little bit more in the background now, but I'm the head of platform at Reach Capital. We are an early stage venture capital firm focused on the education and workforce investments. Mm -hmm. One of the longest running ed tech focused VCs out there. We recently just closed our fourth fund, which about 215, 215 million. So you Congratulations. Know, a lot more powder to go. Yeah. I oversee mostly our content and community and dabble in some portfolio support at, at Reach Capital. Mm -hmm. Before this, you know, I was a journalist at Ed Surge. Right. Founder, Ed Surge, running a newsroom. Right. And so I don't flex my writing muscles as much as I used to, but I still feel, I still feel the itch. Yeah. Right Absolutely. And, and keep scratching, I would say, as someone who subscribes to your newsletter, which will include information about the newsletter for folks who want to keep up on what you're doing. You do a little bit of writing there where folks can track your thoughts. And I, I would say the tone is probably not typical. There's a little more of your voice and personality, which is part of what I really enjoy, which is why I'm happy to have you back on. One of the things I know you were doing some experiments with was using generative AI and other tools to help you with your writing, you know, maybe wearing your more writerly hat. Any thoughts on some of the new tools that are emerging and how they're impacting our ability to write? I know you've done some experimentation in the space. Back when GPT-3 came out, I wanted to see if it could write like me. So I created a bot that was trained on all of my ed search articles back in, you know, my previous career. And what I created was, yeah, a bot that could sound like me, but produce fake news. So mm -hmm. it's like a fake news bot that sounds like me, which is kind of cool and also problematic in, in many ways, as you can imagine. Yeah. So I think that exercise, which kind of was my impetus for restarting my some kind of newsletter cadence. It kind of just was a validation that, yeah, you know, I think AI has kind of like crossed this threshold where it is capable of sounding like me and in many ways exceeding. It is on par and in many cases can like exceed human capabilities and yeah. human likeness, right? Yeah. And so, you know, that won't be news to your audience, but that was my like initial foray into AI and to also just getting back on onto the newsletter writing train. Right. I think these days I find that I'm just not using it as much, but I may just be a peculiar case. You know, when you think of writing, there's like the product and the process. Mm -hmm. I like the process. I think the process helps me think, but thinking is hard. Right. And I think that's why a lot of people don't like writing. Most people just like want the product. Most people want to have written. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of the AI writing tools out in the market these days kind of cater towards. Right. Right. And yeah. I've used a few of those. They're fine. They get the job done, but I don't get like the masochistic kind of joy and satisfaction that I've come to expect and like from writing. Yeah, it does feel like if this is like a James Cameron script that we're all living through right now, it does seem like we should at least know what the AI empowered version of what we do might be. And then we make a choice, right? And then it's up to you how much you want to lean in lean out. To your credit, I believe I got the chronology right. You were testing on GPT prior to the mass release of chat GPT, right? You were using some of these tools. Yeah, I was like doing GPT-3 Playground. They had the sandbox. Yeah, I played with it around maybe two or three months before chat GPT came out. 
which is good, which is why we got to figure out what you're playing with now so that we're ahead of the curve so that two to three months from now, when the rest of us catch up, you know, I think I might have opened up a a time paradox in in, in the process there. But again, it's a nod to Jim Cameron. Thoughts on just the AI, because that's another thing in your newsletter, which has some really interesting information. The latest is talking a lot about the appetite for investment and the fact that, you know, there's been some cooling off of ed tech, which was running really hot mid pandemic. And now we're starting to kind of come out of whatever the pandemic mindset is into something new. And you're trying to, you know, get the temperature assessed a little bit there. But the one area that is still running hot is AI. Yeah. Can you help catch us up? We'll include a link to your newsletter and folks can learn all about this at Reach, who does a really great job of sharing out this type of information for everyone. But if you were to kind of characterize the current investment climate in education, in ed tech, and also, you know, Reach is interesting because of its reach where like there are investments really across the spectrum of education. It's not just K-12 or higher ed or enterprise. You really are broad in your perspective, which I do like, because I think sometimes people may miss that. But can you provide us a little bit of a a sense of what's out there in the world around us? Yeah. So the article you're alluding to is a continuation of a tradition I started at EdSearch. I used to survey, you know, at the half year and full year mark, what the state of U.S. ed tech funding is at a high level. And then, you know, share some observations and trends around like what may be fueling, you know, some of these numbers and the deals that we've seen. Yeah. And so, you know, this halftime report for 2023, the tally, I think should be to no surprise is lower in terms of the invested capital in yeah. U.S. ed tech companies. That is true across the board for, I think, all tech companies yeah. in, in, in the industry. So my tally came out to $2.2 billion. And I think even that is a generous kind of tally because a big chunk of that came, I would say, from two like outsized and outlier deals that both of them happen to be publishers that are just re-emerging from, you know, they've already kind of had like their belt tightening moments prior to our current macroeconomic downturn. But it is interesting to see that, you know, there are still interested investors in kind of injecting a lot of capital in growth rounds for these two publishers. And the two I'm referring to are, are Cengage, which is mostly in a higher ed space. They had a failed kind of merger with McGraw Hill a mm-hmm. few years back. Mm-hmm. But it seems like, you know, they are still, you know, they're they're still around, you know, there's still a very sizable presence in the U.S. market. And I think, yeah, this private equity firm is at least confident in their ability for their expansion of the digital content in the higher ed market. The other publisher is Amplify, right? They've been kind of slowly amassing a portfolio of K-12 curriculum and assessment tools in recent years. They're kind of almost like a phoenix, kind of like rising from the ashes of their former Amplify under on the News Corp when they tried to do a lot of things right. under the under the sun, including hardware. Right. So Wireless bit, generation back in the day, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like these are like the two big outsized deals. They accounted for, I would say about a third of the two point two billion dollars that, that that we tallied. Yeah. But I think at different stages when you slice it up, you know, the funding declines that they don't hit every funding stage equally. Right. I think where we saw the most drop off was in the growth, you know, the mid to later stage funding rounds Right. for companies, you know, their series B's and series C rounds. Mm-hmm. And this is a reflection of the fact that I think a lot of growth capital has kind of retreated away. And for companies that raised at a really high valuation during yeah. the boom times of the last couple of years, they have been a like funding it harder to grow into those valuations and be to justify raising at, you know, even higher valuations. Right. Right. And so I think at the mid and like later stages, there's going to be growth valuation pressures, not a full reset, but certainly, you know, write downs, you know, kind of a lowering of the valuations. But I think at the early stage, we're still seeing a lot of pipeline opportunities, a lot of interesting tools knocking on the door. And so the early stages, you know, it's still very robust. Keeping it's very busy, valuation pressures have not been as evident as they have been on the lower stage. And one could argue that this may actually be a healthier 
like reset. You know, yeah. Is it a bit of a buyer's market now? Is it investor friendly right now? Maybe there are better deals than there were during the fever pitch that we saw, especially in 2021. That was interesting to me to see how that really was reflective, I, I guess, of you know pandemic spending in a lot of ways. But I think if you think about the cyclical nature of things, you know, in some ways, this is a, a retrenching in response to that. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there is still an opportunity to kind of catch the next wave, which in some ways may be powered by AI to the previous topic we were talking about, where there is a lot of new early stage activity around leveraging AI in interesting yeah. ways in learning contexts. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think a lot of the early stage opportunities now, many of them are fueled by AI. And many of these opportunities are very attractive to investors. And like it is the next big thing. And I would say it's unlike the last big thing, which is Web3. I think AI has more tangible and realizable output. You can see and you know enjoy more tangibly, like see what AI is capable of. Mm -hmm. So yeah, bucking the trend of, you know, the general like funding downturn are like a lot of these like AI companies and, you know, outside of ed tech, the companies that are building like new foundational models, like, you know, the, the Anthropics, the Mosaics, like the other, the open AI competitors, mm -hmm. they are commanding multi-hundred million dollar rounds. Right. And so there's a lot of like excitement and capital, you know, for, for those companies. And that kind of trickles down a little bit to ed tech as well. Mm -hmm. Right. I think there are a new generation of generative AI native companies that are building tutoring tools or yep. teaching assistants that are coming in, in, in the market. And they are, you know, certainly a step up, you know, from the previous generation of AI companies in terms of their ability to deliver personalized outputs or to make it really easy to just create and build stuff, mm -hmm. whatever it is that you need. Yeah. that are, you know, that I think are commanding a lot of attention and bigger check sizes relative to, you know, some of the like non-AI native companies that, that we're seeing. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point. I was just at ISTE for the first time in Philadelphia last month, and it was interesting to me to see that it's not just ed tech companies who come to ISTE, it's also tech companies who have education as part of their strategic plan. And I think that probably is true as well for AI companies. And if you do think about some of the applications of chatbots, you know, they're very adjacent to learning and or directly delivering a lot of the, you know, you think back to Jill Watson, which IBM developed, you know, years back to be a virtual TA, you know, that was seven, eight years ago. That was a while ago. And this technology has been maturing. Now it's in everybody's hands. Is it going to be a free for all or do you expect some bigger players to emerge? I guess OpenAI is already a big player and a lot of the larger AI companies, technology companies are really leading the charge. But mm -hmm. if you were to think about a, an interesting education ed tech company that is integrating AI, how do you find them? What are some examples of ed tech that's maybe a good application of AI? There is an interesting dynamic here. I mean, every company new or established is talking about an AI strategy. You hear it on like every earnings call. It's, it's so superfluous, I would yeah. say that mm -hmm. it kind of almost like a meme, right? It almost kind of become a meme, like what's your AI strategy? Yeah. And so, you know, I think we have seen a lot of the, like many incumbents and established companies like the Duolingo's and Coursera's kind of roll out certain AI products and features yeah. as enhancements. Conmigo. Uh, Conmigo is one of the, I would say, premier teacher assistants that's out in the market today. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, as with any like markets and new technologies, you know, there's the race to speed, right? Like how quickly can these established companies innovate around AI versus the new crop of upstarts now that are, you know, starting with AI more or less baked in due to DNA, right? And, and the product development process. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think there are several interesting companies in the AI space that, you know, we are seeing today. There's a company called Curiopod that's based, I think, from Norway. That is essentially like, it looks very similar to like a Neuropod, but it's very like AI powered and a less than content generator. Mm. And I think that's a really interesting application of AI 
as a teacher assistant for everything from lesson planning to content delivery yeah. to assessments and then getting a- a- analytics and whatnot. So I think that's that's really interesting. And they've been make they were at ISTE, I believe, and they're you know making inroads into this space. And there's a company in the workforce development space called Workera, which is using AI to essentially create a more precise like map and taxonomy of like workforce specific skills mm-hmm. that you need. I think that there is a big need in a workforce development space to have a better taxonomy or a better kind of understanding a roadmap around like the skill, the progression and, and the scaffolding of skills that are relevant to the jobs right now. And Workera is using, you know, generative AI to kind of help kind of map, you know, our capabilities to those maps. So yeah, I think those are two pretty interesting like upstarts yeah. that we're seeing in space. There are so many, many, many more. Yeah. Like especially in like the tutoring space, especially in like the teacher assistant, you know, lesson planner assistant phase. Right. That it's, you know, it's, it's noisy out there, but I think it's also a reflection of the fact that generative AI also makes it possible for you to build generative AI tools. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, I think it's really lowered the bar. Lower the barrier to entry, I would say. Lower the barrier to entry to just building software that's like tailored for your needs. Yeah. And also the flip side is true too, where I think it's easy to pitch the AI inside, you know, powered by generative AI, when in reality, maybe there's a very light touch on chat GPT on the back end. So that's where, in addition to an AI strategy, I, I think you also, I'm sure Reach is a great example of this. You want to have an AI investment thesis or two as well around where is this technology ultimately going and where will it benefit in particular when it's connected with other things, which does bring me to web three, which is kind of in the Gartner hype cycle. It's in the trough of disillusionment perhaps now, but interestingly, AI is part of web three, at least as I understand it. And then the other two main components that I've heard associated with web three are the blockchain. And AR, VR, you know, mixed reality, whatever you want to call it. Neither of us are Web3 experts, so that's a a caveat. But I'd love to hear a little bit of your perspective, because in some ways, if AI is the bell of the ball, you know, if AI is Marsha Brady, you know, who's Jan and Cindy? Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. But if it's the bell of the ball, everybody cares about AI. No one's really talking necessarily about your blockchain strategy or your... AR, VR strategy, even, you know, meta is kind of retrenching perhaps less about the metaverse, it, less about the metaverse, at least in the the shorter <laughs> near term. As someone who sees the waves come in and out and the, the cycles swing in different directions, thoughts about other technology classes? I haven't been watching Web3 as closely, but as far as noise wise goes, yes, it is a lot, lot less noisy. I think the areas where I do think there are some interesting developments coming is in the idea of like music and creative ownership with Web3, the idea that, you know, it's, you make it more accessible and you enable artists and their audience to kind of own and also earn, you know, from participation in certain kind of Web3 powered uh, Mm -hmm. communities and creative processes. Like, I think that's cool, right? That's a tangible benefit and, you know, that I can see. Yeah. I think the issue that I've had in Web3 is that the use cases have, you know, a, like contrast of AI and ChatGPT, where it's like a chat bot that you can interact with, you can like create good, bad, ugly things with. Like I think Web3, the manifestation of what Web3 can create has, has been, I would say, more limited and also yeah. maybe even more questionable, right? There's like NFTs and crypto, which you could right. say like have been... They can cater to our gambling, you know, <laughs> our darker impulses sometimes, right? Right. I mean, NFTs and crypto, you know, like those have been the dominant kind of like manifestations of like Web3 technologies. Right. Perhaps they shouldn't, they probably capture an outsized share of our attention, you know, in terms of like all the, you know, interesting things that are happening in Web3 around like clubs and memberships and around like our digital I- identity. But mm-hmm. Yeah, and I also Web3 kind of suffers from a, it's just a not very intuitive like user interface with Web3. Yeah. I don't know if you've tried to like set up your MetaMask wallet and try mm-hmm. to like buy exchange stuff. It's just kind of clunky. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. 
And so this may feel like surface level, but I feel like it's these kinds of like user experiences that kind of get in the way of broader mass adoption. Yeah. I'm going to start saying I said this, but I feel like someone else said this at some point that the 21st century is the century of the interface. But I think to a certain extent, it's true if you think about how much evolution has been happening to the interfaces that we work with, whether you look at the iPhone and now we're looking at ChatGPT, where it really was in a lot of ways, a user experience innovation that really kicked off this revelatory wave that we're kind of in the middle of. Where do you see things headed perhaps a little bit further in the future? I still haven't watched the new season of Black Mirror because I feel like we're living in like a, a mediocre episode of, of Black Mirror nowadays. So like my appetite for, for dark sci-fi isn't perhaps as high these days. But if you were to look ahead a little bit, put your imagineering Apple vision glasses on and start thinking about where the future of education might be headed. Anything new out there? Any ideas capturing your imagination? Anything you're thinking about? You know, we talked a lot about AI, artificial intelligence. The other flip side of what we're seeing in the market and what we've invested in is actually a lot of like human, human capability mm -hmm. tools and, and, and services, right? I think we're living in a time where in the education sector, you know, and maybe some others, you know, there's just a lot of like labor movement and like human and capital constraints and movement happening around, you know, in K-12 and higher ed, you know, there's long been these issues of like teacher shortages mm -hmm. and teacher shortages coming at a time when I think that the needs for helping students may be even greater as mm -hmm. they come back from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think AI is... It's a cool tool. It's a cool tool in a way that like Google search is a really cool tool and kind of unlocked a lot. It really did change a lot of how we learn and how we work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to the extent that I don't think it can really like help solve some of the actual human capital kind of issues mm -hmm. that are, you know, we still live in the world and reality, right? You know, it's like we still prefer, as we learned the pandemic, we still prefer some human connections, right? Over yeah. AI connections. And so maybe there are ways that AI can help enable, you know, more effective matchmaking services in the human constraint part, whether it's around staffing of like teachers and other staff, whether it's about helping to train up, you know, nurses or yeah. medical assistants more quickly. We've invested in some of these categories, particular, you know, with substitute teachers, there's a company called Swing that's really helping to shore up, you know, the staffing needs in a lot of schools and districts. For mental health you know that was like another big thing that mm -hmm. is another big thing yeah so we've invested in a company called clayful that's helping to connect kids with trained adults who can mm -hmm. help you know talk to them you know sometimes you just want a, a human connection to help you get through a rut a similar conversation at the right moment it can help stave off bigger problems down the line i don't know i think there are ways in which ai can be plugged in to support these kinds of services and connections but, you know, this is like where we're going to the non-AI part, right? You know, the, the education right. sector that I think is certainly, you know, less sexy than AI, but I feel like it's more important, right? more critical. That's interesting to start thinking about how AI could really help with our human skills. Like, are there ways to kind of turn it back on? I saw this applied to VR where, you know, virtual empathy, you know, could you teach people social, emotional skills. Immersion was a company that, that's been doing a little bit of that. What tools teach us to be better humans to each other? And, you know, I have been hearing more and more about you know, a crisis in civility at the same time where people are having a harder time, you know, finding a public square where they could actually engage with other people without it going dark, where frequently that darkness is associated with technology. But could it somehow be deployed in a different way because the technology frequently is not really steering in one way or another it's how do we choose to apply it that's an interesting perspective there we're rounding the far turn here tony it's always amazing to have you on and we look forward we're gonna have to figure out new levels of reward systems to continue to incentivize you to come back we covered a lot as folks head back to the rest of their lives. Is there anything else you wanted to bring up or just maybe emphasize some closing remarks? You know, touch the grass, 
in the world of venture, it is very easy to get caught up in things like AI and, and it's the nature of the job is a little bit of FOMO. Uh, I think certainly for me, you know, trying to stay abreast of all of the AI developments can be, you know, it, it can certainly be challenging. It can be overwhelming, but yeah, I think that AI in the service of human potential and unlocking human capacities and connections is, I think, where at least we at Reach are going to be the most discerning and focused on as we look and consider, you know, what the future of the world will look like that's, you know, empowered and enabled by AI. I mean, I also want to preface saying like AI sounds like a crazy new thing, but it is not a crazy new thing. You know, like we have invested in previous generations of AI enabled tools before. Yeah. And so for all of the optimism, hype, hysteria around what AI can bring, I mean, I think history shows that humans, you know, we adapt. Humans are adaptable with people. Schools, education system may be a little bit slower to adapt, but it, it comes around, mm -hmm. you know. I think of like search as kind of a corollary, as kind of like a parallel or, or you know, reference for you know, a groundbreaking technology that was initially met with a lot of hype and hysteria and then we kind of adapted to it and it kind of became, it became the new normal. Yeah. You know, certain jobs were displaced, certain jobs were changed, but then new jobs were created. And so oh, I think that uh, I just wouldn't like rest too much on some of these narratives we're seeing around like the very dramatic utopian or dystopia that right. we paint when it was yeah. AI, yeah. you know. I'm not a believer in the mass extinction uh, theory. Right. AI that we have seen. Yeah, I've been coming around to the other idea as well, even if you think back to Thomas Malthus and the idea that we were going to run out of food and then, like it or not, we figured out how to produce a lot of food to feed the world in ways. Still, there's food insecurity. There's still problems out there, but technology has really powered a lot of human development. You know, the question I think is going to be, can we identify the right problems that this new technology can help us solve. And yeah. to me, it's partly the human piece. And the other one is probably something around climate and sustainability. We didn't yeah. necessarily talk about that. Are there startups that are looking at how sustainability intersects with the education sector? I would hope so, but I haven't seen it. Uh, nothing not on top of mind right now. Hopping yet. Ben Evans, he's a writer formerly from a Jersey. He has a really good blog post called AI and the Automation of Work. Mm. And it, he brings in a really interesting like historical lens into his analysis of the latest tech trends slash mm. fans. Mm. And then, you know, there's this fallacy that, you know, you kind of alluded to that, like there's only a finite amount of work that can be done. And yeah. if AI does more of that work, then like, well, humans aren't going to do work. But that's been disproven time and time again. Right. You know, with the printing press, with the typewriter, with the computer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if the work is valuable, like there's even more of those jobs and work. Like, right. That, right. That, that become available. Yeah. And so I really like that piece. That was like a recent piece that I ran that I think was really, I think it was refreshingly grounding. Interesting. You know. Yeah. In, we'll make sure we include that in the show notes for folks to catch up. We'll also include links to Tony's newsletter and what Reach Capital has going on. Tony, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Always a pleasure. And I will be sitting by my mailbox waiting for the magnet. Fantastic. And hopefully our listeners enjoyed what you heard. If you did, please subscribe, write a review, do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. <laughs>